Okay, we're going to go ahead and move into chapter 6. This is on rational functions and basically basic um, multiplicative operations on them. By multiplicative, I just mean multiplying and dividing them. So here's the definition. You'll see a lot of these. But the formal definition is uh, of a rational expression. Just remember, um, algebraic expression is a combination of variable terms, constants, and mathematical art, uh, operators. So a rational expression is a fraction whose numerator and denominator are polynomials. So here are some examples. Numerator is 3x plus 7. That's a linear polynomial. 2 is the constant polynomial 2. Here we have a degree 2 factored polynomial in the numerator and a linear polynomial in the denominator. Here just another linear polynomial. By linear that means degree 1 polynomial in the numerator and a degree 2 polynomial in the denominator. So <coughs> these are going to act as functions. So one of the things we want to find out is their domain. So just a reminder, the domain of a real valued function, so that means the inputs are real numbers and the output are real numbers. There's actually complex valued functions that you'll never see unless you're a math major and you'll see that later on in university. So the domain of a real valued function is the largest set of real numbers such that the output, when plugged into the input, so x is the input, the output is f of x, such that the output, f of x, is also a real number. So with fractions we have always the problem. We can't divide by zero. So if inputting some real number into a function would result in division by zero, then we have to exclude that real number, or in some cases numbers, from the domain. So look right here at this example. So this is a rational expression, and we're just going to pretend it's a function. Like, <coughs> we'll actually do this right down here. So normally I would have f of x equals, uh, and I don't know if it's just my laziness on example one, or the book just says, just pretend these are functions. Um, but just suppose this is f of x equals this expression. So in this case, if x were equal to minus 4, then minus 4 plus 4 is 0. And we would have to exclude minus 4 from the domain because we can't divide by 0. So let me give you an important fact. Um, so this is just going to be a fact you can use in sight without justification. So we're talking about the domain. And domains are used in the context of relations or functions. In this case we're going to be talking about functions. The domain of any and here's the keyword polynomial function. Ah, I spelled it right. Function is the entire real line minus infinity to infinity. But that only applies to polynomial functions. <clears throat> so remember a rational function such as f of x is equal to 2x squared minus 7 over 5x minus 3. The numerator is a polynomial and the denominator is a polynomial. We don't care, so that means their individual domains are both infinity to infinity, the real line. But we don't 
care about what their individual domains are because we have created a new function by taking the ratio of one polynomial by another polynomial. So in this case, we're talking about the domain of all of this right here. And what do we do to find it? We only care about the denominator, not the numerator. We want to find out where the denominator is equal to zero. So we set the denominator equal to zero, and we solve for x. And then we write the domain. So the domain of f is everything except 3 fifths. So I start with minus infinity and I go all the way up to 3 fifths by using the open symbol here for this interval. That means 3 fifths is not included in the domain. Then I take the union. Remember the union looks like a u. And I start again just on the other side of 3 fifths and I go all the way to infinity. There are easier ways to write the set of real numbers, of all real numbers except 3 fifths, but this is the way your book gives it. If you're curious, the real line is given by the symbol R, and if I wanted to exclude it, I would just say R minus one element, three fifths. This kind of notation is beautiful set notation, but it's only FYI for your information. You cannot enter that in my math lab and get a correct answer. It won't understand it. This is what it understands. And there's a reason we're focusing on interval notation because many of the aim or the goal for some of you who are STEM majors will be to eventually get to calculus. And calculus is a subset of one of the great partitions of mathematics called analysis. And interval notation is all over in analysis. So it's, it's good to use this. Of course, this is much easier to write as far as set notation. It's just taking the real line and taking from the real line the one single element, three-fifths, but this is what you have to use. A lot of you didn't care about that digression, but uh, that's what the fast-forward button is for, right? So let's actually do some. You've kind of already seen what we're going to be doing. So we're going to find the domain of the following rational functions. So we're just we're going <clears> to, <throat> I don't want to pause the video and check the book. I'm pretty sure this is exactly how the book writes them. I usually try not to deviate it, but I just want to make sure you understand that this is a function. They say it's a function, so it's understood. So all we have to do is we can assume or our assumption is the domain is all real numbers minus, I mean that's, that means we're excluding them from the set, any real number or any real numbers, because many times there's going to be more than one. <coughs> And you should be able to finish the sentence for me that <clears throat> make the denominator zero. So there are no real numbers that make the denominator zero because the denominator is a constant. So the domain of 1a is minus infinity to infinity. 
So for 1b, we'll have f of x equals 5x squared minus 3 over x minus 1. We don't care about the numerator again. All we do is I grab that denominator and I set it equal to 0 and I solve for x. And then I write the domain. The domain is all real numbers except that value of x. And this is how they want it seen in my math lab, I'm assuming. Sometimes they can surprise me at how they want things written. And this is 1c. 1c is a good example. Let me readjust here. Um, <clears throat> I've been writing so much, my, my fingers are really sore from writing. So if my writing looks really odd, it's because I've been... This has been a week of exams for me, and I just don't like to give exams and grade them unless you get some kind of comments. So anytime you miss something, if I can read your writing and find out what it was, you get a comment. That's a lot of typing. But I've just discovered an app in Chrome that allows me to speak what I want to say, and I'm using that my fingers are shot. So in this case what we have to do is again we look at the denominator and set it equal to 0. So what do we do? We have to factor. The only way I can solve this equation right here is to factor. And you will always be able to factor it. So in factoring, the GCF of x squared minus 2x and minus 15 is 1. So I can't factor out anything. So we'll go ahead and factor this really fast using the tic-tac-toe method or whatever you want to call it. I noticed a lot of you using it on the exams that I'm still in the process of grading. So I need x squared here minus 15. And my middle term is always the bottom term. Since it's monic, that makes it easier. That's x and that's x. Now 15 is 5 times 3, <clears throat> but one of those have to be negative, And we want to be the larger of the two to be negative, since when I add them, I have to get minus 2x. So this gives me my factorization. So the factorization is x plus 3 times x minus 5 is equal to 0. That's the reason factorization is really important for the rest of this class. And then I just set each individual factor equal to 0. This is basically something we've already done, and you've actually just been tested on it. Uh, the test questions are pretty basic. <coughs> because you're going to have plenty of opportunity to factor harder polynomials in the in this chapter 6 text test. So this gives me x is equal to minus 3 and this gives me x is equal to 5. So how do we write that in the interval notation? This is where you just have to get the pattern. So if you want uh, I'll actually show you this on the number line first. Just one visual, and that may help. So here's my number line. The number line, when I say the real line, that's what I mean. The real line is just the number line. And you can put a zero there if you want. Now I'm going to say minus 3 is here, but we don't want minus 3 in my set. Now I'm going to say 5 is right here, and we don't want it in the set. So I start at minus infinity, and I go all the way up to minus 3, but I don't include minus 3. Then I take the union of another set, and then I start at minus 3, but don't include it, and go all the way to 5. But I don't include 5 either. 
then I skip over 5, and I start at 5 and go all the way to infinity, but in each case I don't include them. So all of this is an open interval. This is the union of three open intervals. This interval is called <coughs> an open interval because I'm using these types of, of parenthetical, I guess, braces, I don't know, brackets. And this is closed. And this is half open, half closed, half open, half closed. So just a reminder there. Okay, so not so bad, right? I'm hoping you feel pretty comfortable with this part. Now if I can just make this get smaller. Okay, mouse time. Let's look at the next problem. Oh, we did all those problems. So now we're going to simplify rational expressions. So what does it mean to simplify a rational expression? Just like when you simplify a fraction, you reduce it to its lowest terms. That means factors that are in the numerator and in the denominator cancel out. It's exactly what we were doing when we would simplify something like a to the sixth power over a to the fourth. Well, I have six factors of a in the numerator. And four factors of a in the denominator. So they cancel out. I get to cancel out four. Uh, there we go. So, what I have, I have two factors of a in the numerator, a times a, and remember when you cancel out, they don't become zeros, they become one. So it's a squared over one, or just a squared. Well, the same type of procedure is going to be working when we simplify each rational expression. We completely factor the numerator and the denominator, and then cancel out like expressions. So here's my 2a. So I have 2x squared. It has a really easy numerator. And then I am dividing over 10x cubed plus 2x squared. So what we do is <coughs> we simplify. The numerator cannot be further simplified. So I'm just going to copy it over. Let me turn my page here. Yeah, I just want to make sure I've copied this down right. Now for the bottom, we have to factor out the GCF. So the GCF of these two terms, well the GCF of 10 and 2 is 2, and the GCF of x cubed and x squared is x squared. So the GCF is 2x squared. So that's the GCF, and I'm factoring it out. So 10x cubed divided by my GCF is, well, 10 divided by 2 is 5. And x cubed divided by x squared is x. And then plus 2x squared divided by plus 2x squared is plus 1. So the, it's been simplified as far as the factorization element goes as much as I can. But if we look... 2x squared is the same in the top as in the bottom. So what do I get? They cancel out. Remember, when you cancel them, they become 1. So the numerator becomes 1, and this is 1 times 5x plus 1, which is just 5x plus 1. So just a reminder these are products, 2 times x squared. And then I have that exact same product down below, 2 times x squared. That's what can be factored out. If I have 5x plus 3, 
and 5x minus 1. This is wrong. It is a common error. You cannot cancel out the 5x's because these are is the sum of two terms and the difference can't do that. What could you do? If I have 5x plus 3 in the numerator and 5x plus 3 in the denominator, then these represent the exact same value or quantity. So those could be canceled out and I would get 1. But of course here I would have to make the stipulation as long as x is not equal to minus 3 fifths because if x were equal to minus 3 fifths the whole expression is undefined at that value. So let's go ahead and do another one. So yeah, there are going to be a lot of factorizations here. So you have to get really good at factorization. And uh, sometimes you're going to be factoring polynomials, and sometimes you're going to be factoring uh, binomials, and to factor a binomial, you literally just look for the GCF. So let's do 2B. So 9x squared. Now I'm not going to, if I factor all of these for you, it will take forever to get through this lecture, so I'm not. In each case, I'm just going to factor one of them on paper for you or in the lecture and then I will let you verify or factor on your own the other. So here we have two polynomials and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just simply declare that the factorization of 8x squared plus x minus 7 wrong, there we go, is 8x minus 7 times x plus 1. And you can quickly verify that, just spoil it. 8x times x is 8x squared, minus 7 times uh, 1 is minus 7, minus 7x plus 8x is x. So let's go ahead and factor um, using the, the, the known method. Some of you, uh, it looked to me like, on the exam, have another method, or you've already simplified the method I've given you. Like I said, this method, you can use any method you want, as long as you're able to clearly demonstrate that it's you who are doing the factoring and So this is an interesting one because 9x squared, the square root of 9x squared is 3x. So the first term is a perfect square and the square root of 4 is equal to 2. So this is almost a candidate for a perfect square binomial. But if I multiply, remember we have this new factor, it's called the uh, cross term factor. If I multiply 2 times what I'm given here, times 2 times 3x, I get 4 times 3x which is equal to 12x. So if the middle term were 12x, this would have the factorization of 3x plus 2 squared. But my middle term isn't 12x, so I have to do it this way. So a lot of choices here and they have to add up to 13x. So let's do 1 and 4, 9x and x. Okay, so 9x times x is 9x. So 9x times x is 9x squared. 1 times 4 is 4. 
So that's 9x plus 4x. So that gives me 14, 13x. So my factorization is 9x plus 4. Remember we're going kitty corner in x plus 1. So now the numerator and the denominator have been factored. And now we cancel out like factors. So the only like factor is x plus 7. So the final answer is 9x plus 4. It's okay if you keep it in parentheses, but there's no need to over 8x minus 7. Just realize there's nothing you can do with that 9x and that 8x. This is it. This is done. Why? Because 9x plus 4 is a prime linear factor, and 8x minus 7 is a prime linear factor. Just like if you had 7 fifths as a fraction, you can't reduce that. 7 is prime and 5 is prime. That's fully reduced, fully simplified. 9x plus 4 is a prime linear polynomial. It's a, <coughs> it's a binomial. And 8x minus 7 is a prime binomial. By prime means there is no further factorization. So remember the process of factorization is changing sums into products. Well, not that. Here we go. So let's do number 2c. So here this is not going to be bad. 5z to the fourth. There's nothing that can be done that's a single term. So there's no factoring possible there. So remember factoring takes sums to products. And then I have 10z to the fifth minus 5z to the fourth. So what we do is I factor out the GCF. So the GCF of 10 and 5 is 5. And the Z GCF of z to the fifth and z to the fourth is z to the fourth. So 10z to the fifth divided by 5z to the fourth is 2z minus 5z to the fourth divided by 5z to the fourth is minus 1. And now as you can see, we do have a common factor in the numerator, 5z to the fourth, and the same factor appears in the denominator. So again, this doesn't go to 0, it goes to 1. Things cancel out, turn into 1's. This is 1 times 2z minus 1, or just 2z minus 1. So these are really important. This is something that should go in your notes. This is called factoring out a negative 1. So if I have minus a minus b, I just factored out a minus 1. I don't put minus 1 there. I'm lazy and I just put minus. So that's minus a plus b. a minus b is minus in parentheses. So notice what I'm doing. All I'm doing is I'm writing parentheses. I'm putting a minus in front of it. And then what goes in the parentheses is the opposite sign of what's existing. So the minus a becomes a positive a, so we don't write positive. And the minus b becomes plus b, and we do write a plus b because we're, it, it denotes addition here. So these are things to keep in mind. We will be using them. As a matter of fact, we're going to be using them right here in example 3. It's a really important factorization tool. We're going to use all of our properties of real numbers to do all of this. So 2 plus x divided by x plus 2. 
but I'm now going to use the commutativity of addition to write x plus 2 is 2 plus x. Now 2 plus x in the top is the, exactly the same as the 2 plus x in the bottom, so that's equal to 1 provided x is not equal to minus 2. And here is a question mark for me. It's just kind of a question mark. I don't think my math lab requires that you add this information. That's a criticism of my math lab uh, on this point. You should add this information, but I don't think you do because it's equal to 1 if and only if x is not equal to minus 2 because if x is equal to minus 2 the whole expression is undefined. So now let's do 3b. So 2 minus x over x minus 2. Now notice this is subtraction. So we don't have a commutative property of subtraction. It's not true in general that a minus b is the same as b minus a. You want to check me on that? Is 5 minus 3 the same as 3 minus 5? They're not, but they are related. 5 minus 3 is equal to 2, and 3 minus 5 is equal to minus 2. So 5 minus 3 is equal to minus 3 minus 5. And we're actually going to use that right now. 2 minus x, that's fine. x minus 2 is equal to minus... minus x. So just multiply that in. Minus 1 times 2 is minus 2. Minus times minus x is x. So if you need to, what cancels out here? I'm going to put this here in its full glory. I'm going to fill in all of the details. That's times minus 1. And that's a 2 there. It kind of looks like a z. I'll make it look more like a 2 there. So what factors cancel out? The 2 minus x factor. And they become 1's. So this is equal to 1 divided by minus 1. But that's just equal to minus 1. So be careful there. And here is another one. We'll, we'll, I have a feeling it's going to be the same. I'm going to have to use those factorizations at some point. What is this one? This is example, just example 4. So just example 4. There is no A or B. So I'm going to challenge you to pause the video and work this one out on your own. So I'm going to help you out. The numerator we can factor out at 2 and the denominator we're going to have to factor it. It's just a degree 2 polynomial that we want to factor. So go ahead and try to do this one on your own. So hopefully you paused it and now you're unpausing it. So we're going to factor out a 2 from the numerator. So 18 divided by 2 is 9. Minus 2x squared divided by 2 is minus x squared. And it turns out that the factorization of x squared minus 2x minus 3, that's something you should be able to do, is x plus 1 times x minus 3. You're going, whoa, I can't factor that. But let's 
take a closer look at this factor right here. So 9 minus x squared is the same thing as 3 squared minus x squared. Oh, that's the difference of square factorization. So that's 3 minus x times 3 plus x. So let's go ahead and add that into my formula, into what I've written down. So that's 2, and 9 minus x squared is 3 minus x, times 3 plus x, and it's all over x plus 1 times x minus 3. Well, it's still, something's still wrong, because <clears throat> if I'm looking at, so notice my, let's, first thing, let's notice, my numerator is three factors, 2 times 3x, three, 3 minus x times 3 plus x. That's one thing times another thing times another thing. That's what I mean by three, the product of three factors. My denominator is the product of two factors. One factor is x plus 1, and the next factor is x minus 3. The only candidate for similar factors is 3 minus x and x minus 3. So if I negate x minus 3, if I want to write this, what I notice here is x minus 3 is equal to, let's put my minus sign here, I'm going to factor out a minus 1 from the x minus 3 term. So let me show you this explicitly. So I write two parentheses, write a minus 1 in front of it, then I change the x to a minus x, and a minus 3 to a plus 3. That still doesn't look like what anything I have, but notice if I rearrange, this is plus here, so minus x plus 3 is the same as 3 minus x. Wow! So this is the same thing as 2 times 3 minus x times 3 plus x times, it's over, sorry, divided by x plus 1, times minus 1. Here's my minus right here. So since minus 1, since this is all multiplication, I'm going to put the minus out here in the front. 3 minus x. Now I can actually cancel some factors. Just 2, and the only thing that gets canceled is the 3 minus x and the 3 minus x. So the customary way to write that is I only have one negative, and that's in the denominator. So I'm going to put it right out here, even with the division line, if you've got good mathematical typography, typesetting rather, it'll look like that way. Then I'm going to write what does not get canceled in the numerator, and the minus, remember I've already put up here on the front, more or less in line with the division sign, x plus 1. Now, the x plus 1, since it's its only factor, I don't necessarily have to put those parentheses there. But you can. And that's just totally a matter of your own preferences. And sometimes I think it's better to... Um, remove the parentheses, but in this case I kind of like them to be there. I don't know. They're, they're mathematically equivalent so it doesn't matter. So here we're going to simplify each rational expression. So I'm going to do the first one for you. Uh, it's important. I'm not going to test you on this one. Although it's an important thing that you're aware of 
its factorization. So the first one uh, so this is 5a is x notice this is a cube plus 8 over 2 plus x so this has to deal with our factorization of a cubic and what I'm going to do to remind you is x cubed is to recall that 8 is the same as 2 cubed. So we have to go back and look at our notes and see the factorization of the sum of cubes. So it's x plus 2 times x squared minus 2x plus 2 squared all over 2 plus x. Now I'm going to be lazy here. I think you've reached a stage that you should be okay with this. x plus 2 is the same as 2 plus x. So I'm canceling them. That leaves the denominator equal to 1. So my final result is I'm just going to simplify x squared minus 2x plus 2 squared to obtain x squared minus 2x plus 4. The only simplification was writing 2 squared is 4. So this one required factorization formula. Yeah, I don't recall which section it was in. I think it was in, the, it was in chapter 5. What section? Maybe 5.5. The factorization formula for sum of cubes. There's also a difference of cubes, but this is a sum of cubes. And 5b. Oh, this is an interesting one, too. So, I have 2y squared plus 2. So, I hope you're immediately saying I can factor out a 2 from there. But this bottom one is a cubic polynomial in the variable y. And it's not the sum of two cubes because there's it's a sum of more than two more than two things. So we're gonna have to use some tricks here. Let's just do the most obvious. Let's factor out a two from the numerator. So two y squared divided by two is y squared. And two divided by two is one. Here the only thing I can invite you to note is there are four terms. <clears throat> so we have had instances in the past <clears throat> where we can factor four terms like this by grouping. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out the greatest common factor of this first group. So the greatest common factor of y cubed and 5y squared is y squared. Okay, so I'm going to write it that way. y squared times y minus 5 a similar question was on the exam, or uh, a factorization of this form. And I'm going to continue on. Now, some of you are already smart enough to realize that the end result is probably going to have y squared plus 1 as a factor somewhere. So we don't have it anywhere right now. But notice that this is plus 1 
times y minus 5. So if I look at these two terms, this is one term, and <clears throat> this is another term, they have a common factor. And that common factor is y minus 5. So I'm going to factor out y minus 5. <clears throat> so y squared times y minus 5 divided by y minus 5 leaves me a y squared. Plus 1 times y minus 5 divided by y minus 5 gives me a 1. And finally we reach a point where we have a factor in the numerator <clears throat> and a factor in the denominator that are the same. So I write what I have left over. I have left over a factor of 2 in the numerator and a y minus 5 term in the denominator. It makes no difference whether you leave it in parentheses or not. <clears throat> so now we're going to multiply rational expressions. And then we're going to divide them. <coughs> Sorry, people. So for this particular part, I'm, gonna, I'm going to just write the factored forms. I'm no longer going to factor anything. I will tell you what you should do to factor them, and that's it. Because what we want to focus on on this part is canceling factors. So here's a skill that you should have mastered. Suppose I have x to the fifth times y to the eighth over z to the fourth times x. I'm hoping you're good enough now to say, well, look, here's a x to a fifth. Here's five x's multiplied together in the numerator and one x multiplied together in the denominator. So one of those x's will cancel out, leave me x to the fourth, y to the eighth, z to the fourth. So in other words, you just cancel out one factor that's supposed to, an xing out an x, it still becomes an x. So you, that cancels out. So we're going to be doing something similar. We're going to be multiplying and then simplifying. So right now, here is the big no-no. When you go to multiply these out, you do not use distribution. If you use distribution, you've ruined everything. So the first thing I want to do is change my color. This is 6a. Is I want to completely factor every term. 1 plus 3n is a prime linear factor, and 2n is just a product. There's nothing that can be done. And I'm using the dot for multiplication here. You can also use big parentheses. So up here, 2n minus 4, I'm going to factor out a 2. That's going to leave me n minus 2. Now on the bottom, this polynomial, when I factor it, I'm going to get n minus 1 times 3n plus 1. So now becomes the search for common factors. Here is a 2. And here is a 2. I can only cancel the 2, not the n, just the 2. n minus 2, there is no n minus 2 up here. 1 plus 3n, there's not a 1 plus 3n, but there's an equivalent to it, 3n plus 1. Just remember, 1 plus 3n is the same as 3n plus 1. Why? That's just the commu commutativity of addition. So these, this entire factor here, if you want to put it in parentheses, cancel, and that one. So what do you do next? You simply write as a fraction every 
factor that remains. What remains in the top is an n minus 2, and on the bottom we have an n, and notice this is multiplication, so it's n times n minus 1, and that's its simplification. So x cubed minus 1. And that's the same as x cubed minus 1 cubed. So that means we're going to use the difference of cubes for that factorization. Minus 3x plus 3. And we're multiplying that by 15x squared over x squared plus x plus 1. So let's start simplifying. The only thing I would think that you would need help with is this is the difference of cubes. So x cubed minus 1 is x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1. That is its factorization. If you write it as x squared minus 1 cubed, you can look at the formula. Now, let's, uh, let's scoot this over and give me some more room. Give me full screen here. Now, here I can clearly factor out a 3. So this is going to be 3 minus 3x divided by 3 is minus x plus 1. Now, minus x plus 1 is the same as 1 minus x. And the factorization of x squared plus x plus 1, uh, it's prime. There is no factorization of this. This is worth doing. So let's try to factor x squared plus x plus 1. Because normally you've been dealing with polynomials that can be factored. And suddenly we've encountered one that can't be factored. So let's just... let's. Let's go over that. Let's try to factor x squared plus x plus 1. So this is my x squared, this is my 1, this is my x. This is really easy to discover that it can't be factored. So I have to put an x here and an x here. There's no choice. So x times x is x squared. Here, 1, I have two choices. My two choices for 1 is 1 times 1. And my other choice is minus 1 times minus 1. And we don't want to use the minus 1 times minus 1 because when you add them together, you're going to get a negative. So I have to put a 1 there and a 1 there. So that gives me x plus x. And x plus x is equal to 2x, and that's not equal to x. And if you were to do the minus 1 and you don't believe me, then I would have... minus x, minus x, then I have minus 2x, and that's not x. So what we conclude, we literally exhausted all of our possibilities, that this polynomial is prime. So I'm going to go ahead and put it in parentheses, and the reason I'm doing that is it's probably, if you do that, it's probably less likely that you'll make some weird mistake. So now I'm looking for like terms. Well, here I have x squared, x squared plus x plus 1. So I can cancel that. 15 divided by 3 is 5. So I'm going to replace that with 5. x minus 1 and minus x plus 1 minus x plus 1 is the same as 1 minus x. So let's just write it as 1 minus x.
but we still don't have x minus 1, but 1 minus x, if I pull out a negative, is minus 1 plus x, which is equal to minus x minus 1. So let's go ahead and write that down. I probably did an extra, whoops, I didn't want to do that. This is minus, sorry. I hit the control Z and erase some stuff that I would previously written and I'm being lazy today. Now remember the minus 3 has been cancelled. So now maybe I should use red to cancel things out. The minus 3 has been cancelled and the 15 has been changed to 5 because 15 divided by minus 3 is minus 5. I'm leaving the minus right here for right now. And then I can cancel out my x minus 1 term. Now let's change all of this mess into something that is more presentable. So the negative in the bottom is going to come out and it's going to go on the same level as the division line. And the only thing remaining in that slaughter house of, of cancelizations is a 5x squared in the numerator and nothing, everything was gone in the bottom. So you can put a 1 here and that's just going to be simplify <coughs> to minus 5x squared. <coughs> so, so these are some really good examples. Now here's the thing about dividing. So the rule for dividing fractions is the same rule we always use. We can divide two fractions by converting the division sign right there into a multiplication sign. Multiplication of fractions is super simple. We have to pay a price for that conversion though. So the R divided by S turns into its reciprocal S divided by R. That's all there is to it. So let's do this. If you're ever given something like this, A divided by B over C divided by D. You can always figure out what to do. For those of you who know the invert and multiply, I'm going to give it to you right now. So there's two ways to do this. One is called invert and multiply. This should be a, a review. Well, what gets inverted? Remember, this is my denominator right here. My denominator is a fraction. So I take my numerator, which is a divided by b, invert and multiply. What gets inverted? The c divided by d, and it becomes d divided by c, and that's ad over bc. Another way to figure out what to do is just write what this says. This says divide a divided by b, divide it by c divided by d. Well, I can just change the division sign into a multiplication sign, but the price I have to pay is invert the C divided by D. And lo and behold, it's exactly what I did up there, and you get the exact same thing. Oh, well, it would help if I inverted it right. C divided by D inverted is, there we go. And we got the exact same thing. So that's the technique we're going to use. And as soon as we do that, we're already back one step. We, we, we've, we're back to what we were doing before, simplifying multiplication. I don't want to show you that.
So I'm going to do these. <laughs> Again, when we get to number B, I'm not going to do the, I mean, just to keep this lecture at a reasonable level, you, I know it's not true, but in the ideal world, you should already know how to factor all of these trinomials. And indeed you can. So I'm going to factor them for you. And when you're doing the work, you can check it or do it on your own. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change this back to a problem of multiplication. So my numerator is the first fraction here. And this is going to be changed into multiplication by inverting this fraction. Now let's go ahead and work on this. We'll go ahead and put this in parentheses. I sense that might be helpful. The only thing that I can factor here is this term. 2 minus m is a prime, is a prime linear uh, factor because 2 and m don't share any common factor. But 3m squared does share a common factor of 3. So I'm going to factor out the 3 and get m squared minus 4 times 2 minus m over 40. Well, I'm expecting a little bit more about that, that I should be able to do more, and indeed I can. So let's go over here and look at m squared minus 4. Well, m squared minus 4 is really m squared minus 2 squared. And that's one of those special products you just have to know. That's m minus 2 and m plus 2. So instead of, I'm going to be super lazy here, and I'm just going to rewrite this as what it's supposed to be. That's m minus 2. Well, I guess I'll use m minus 2 times m plus 2. And aren't you aggravated? Because here I have a 2 minus m. But 2 minus m is equal to minus m plus, sorry, m minus 2. So I'm going to change this to, again, just being super lazy. I just don't want to rewrite this entire line. It's one of the things I do wish this program had. I wish it would allow me to cut out something and paste it someplace else, and it doesn't have that feature. But it's really simple, and it seldom crashes, and it uses, it loads up fast. And uh, so here is a m minus 2. So let's be careful. The only thing I'm factoring, canceling, is the factor of m minus 2. The minus stays. And then the 8, 8 divided by 40 is the same as 1 over 5, because 40 is equal to 8 times 5. So just to let you see, this right here seems magic, but not really. 8 over 40 is equal to 8 over 8 times 5. So I'm canceling the 8's. That gives me 1 fifth. So I'm going to change that to 1 and change that to 5. And I think that's everything that we can do. So I'm going to, I have a minus, just one minus in there. 
If I had another minus, they would cancel each other out. So I have an m squared in the top. I put my minus and it's out here. Then I have a 5 in the bottom times 3. So here are my constant terms. There's a 5 and there's a 3 times m plus 2. Those have to be in parentheses. So that's equal to minus m squared over 15 times m plus 2. I extended the division line further than I needed. Okay, so let's do this next one. It looks really daunting, but we need to do it. The really, the only thing for this next one is the need to factor everything. There's four polynomials that you have to factor. And what I'm going to do is I'm literally just going to write down their factorizations. So 18y squared plus 9y minus 2 becomes 6y minus 1. I'm not doing this in my head. I have it written out. I've done the work on all this before. 3y, minus, 3y plus 2. So if you multiply that out, <coughs> you'll get 18y squared plus 9y minus 1. 24y squared plus 10y plus 1. So there's, you can only factor it. I mean, there's no common factor there. Then when you do it, thankfully, we're going to get a 6y minus 1 times 4y minus 1. This is going to be divided by doing the factorization first. So 3y squared plus 17y plus 10. That's y plus 5 times 3y plus 2. And 8y squared plus 18y minus 5 is 4y minus 1 times 2y plus 5. But notice I still have this right here. This is a division sign. So I'm going to change that division sign. into a multiplication sign. There I did it. And what do I have to do? Well, maybe it would help if I hit the eraser. I have to flip exactly all of what I just wrote there. The numerator becomes the denominator and the denominator becomes the numerator. That's a big, huge multiplication sign. No ambiguity about that one. So that gives me on the top 4y minus 1 times 2y plus 5 and y plus 5 over 2y y plus 5, 3y plus 2. So now we just, everything is factored into linear uh, factors. So once you've done all of this, this is probably actually easier. Is there a 6y minus 1? Yep, there sure is. 3y, 3y plus 2? Yep, there's a 3y plus 2. That's supposed to be a plus 2 there. Doesn't look like it, but I don't know if I just was lazy about writing it. But let me make sure you realize that's supposed to be a plus 2. 
There we go. So there's a 3y plus 2, and a 3y plus 2, 4y minus 1. All you have to do is look at the numerator. Go factor, factor, factor. 4y minus 1, and here's a 4y minus 1. 2y plus 5 and a y plus 5. So all of this is equal to 2y plus 5 over y plus 5. And that's it. These cannot be simplified. You can't just, you can't do anything to that. Because this is a prime linear binomial. 2y plus 5 can't be factored. y plus 5 can't be factored. So this is it. You're done. Resist the temptation to cancel the 5s. That's really bad. Do not do that. And I'm going to leave a challenge for you. This one. So let's do this. I can do this. Where is my thing? Flame shot. I'll take a screen screen screenshot. So here is the deal. We're going to use PEMDAS. The only thing about this one, I'm going to let you do it on your own, but I'm going to give you a hint and I'm going to give you the answer. So this is PEMDAS. So there are no parentheses, so I can't use that one. There are no exponents to deal with. You do not expand x plus 5. You leave everything factored. So then it says, if we have multiplication and division, they come next in the order they appear. going left to right. So all we do is you can put parentheses here and you simplify this first. So that's the one you're going to do. You're going to do find out what this expression is and then divide it by this expression. So the end result, once you do it all, and remember then and this is going to be division, so you're going to have to change this to multiplication and invert this part right here. So the end result, the end answer is, are you ready for it? Three over 4 times x plus 2. x squared minus 25. That's the difference of perfect squares. 3x plus 5, factor out of 3. x squared minus 3x minus 10. Just use your regular factorization. There's nothing that can be done with the x term as far as factorizations. Nothing can be done with the 4x as factorization. Do not expand x plus 5 to x squared plus 10x plus 25. Leave it as it is. But just remember that x plus 5 squared is equal to x plus 5 times x plus 5. And this should be your final answer. If you attempt it and cannot get it, just send me an email. Tell me which one it is. It's lecture for 6.1, problem 8. 
and I will work it out or take a picture of it and send it to you. So let's do this last problem. It's an applied problem. Cost for pressing compact disk. It's a rational expression. <clears throat> For the ICL production company, the rational function, C of X, is equal to 2.6X plus 10,000 over X, describes the company's cost per disk for pressing X compact disks. Find the cost per disk for pressing 100 and 1,000. I'm just going to do one of these, and then I'll let you do the other. These, this is the simple, simplest of all applied problems we can have because we're literally given um, a function. It's a rational function. It's a cost function. C of X is equal to 2.6 times X plus 10,000 divided by x provided x is not equal to 0. And what does our x stand for? It's x stands for the number of CDs pressed. You know, it's funny. I'm old enough that everything was vinyl records, and then we went to cassette, no, then we went to 8-track tapes, which was in tapes, then we went to cassette tapes, and then the CD hit, and the CD placed every, replaced everything, and then the next thing you know, DVDs have replaced everything, then all of our memory got really small, and uh, it all became digital on your thumb drives or your little... Uh, miniature SD cards. Oh, how things have changed. So they want you to find, part A is literally asking to find the value of C of 100. So all we do is we just replace X times 100 in this case and we perform the arithmetic, and there is absolutely no reason that you need to use a calculator for this. And for those of you who are really calculator dependent, so 2.6 times 10 is equal to 26. You just move the decimal over. So 2.6 times 100 is 260. So you just multiply. So you just move, when you're multiplying by um, the power of 10, oh, it's, it's really, especially if decimals are involved, you just move the decimal. So this is 10,260 divided by 100. So here, the well-known trick, I have a zero up here, a zero up here, so I can cancel out one zero. So that's 1,026 divided by 10. That means I just take 1,026 and move the decimal over. So it's $102.06. Per disk. That's the cost per disk. When you evaluate C, which you get to do on your own, C of 1000, it turns out that the price drops down to $12.6 per disk. So this is what it means when you have scaled up production. Would you rather pay, you couldn't afford to pay 
$102.06, almost $103, to press a compact disc. But if you do 1000 the cost is $12.6. So you have to figure out how much do you have to sell it for to make a profit. And there's probably a profit function, which is the cost, uh, the revenue function minus the cost function. So the revenue function is what we want. I know how much I want to get in profit, blah, blah, blah. But this is a good application of business mathematics. So that is it for lecture 6.1.